All right, greetings all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be addressing you in our third, I think, third or fourth Facebook Live presentation. So I think we know enough now just to get ourselves in trouble and make some really big mistakes. So thanks for joining. It's good to have you all here. And I'm sorry, you should not have quit your job for this because I don't think it's going to be that exciting. Uh, but we'll do our best. And I noticed some people at Halcyon and EE that might need to be working. But otherwise, uh, welcome all. Uh, we have some people up early, people all through Europe, all over the country, all over the world. So it's exciting to have you all here. I have a few things I want to talk to you about today, and we will bring in some interviews with people uh, that we've also recorded so that we can uh, share a diversity of opinion on a few subjects. Uh, one of the things I'd really like to talk about is this time period in history is pretty significant for me, and I've been thinking a lot about it over the subsequent weeks. Just uh, around this time in 1998, uh, GUE was really formalizing itself. We had just started teaching classes. Late in the previous year, in 1997, I had filed the first, uh, uh, the first fictitious name for GUE, which is one of the steps towards corporate development. We started teaching courses in 1998, and late in the year, 1998, we released our first website. So we had a, a number of things going on right around this time period, which really has me thinking a lot about the last 20 years. And over the last couple of years, we've been really, really working hard, and especially over the last year, in developing plans for the next 20 years ahead. So I'm quite excited about that, and I'd like to share some of those details with you. Of course, thinking about all of this and in reflecting on the last 20 years, there are just so many people to thank that there's no way I could possibly do it justice. In fact, some of the discussions I have here are a few slides pulled from a longer presentation that I'll make part of our 20th anniversary uh, release period. So we've got a wide range of initiatives and information and documents that we'll be releasing over the coming months to sort of make a several month uh, 20th anniversary celebration. But I do want to thank everybody out there. We have so many dedicated and passionate instructors and principals over the years and many people that have supported us in, in really unique ways and made everything possible. Before I start, I'd like to reflect a little bit uh, with an infographic series that we've developed. And, and you won't be able to see this as clearly, but we will be releasing it on the website and other places. And in forming this, we really, funny enough, had trouble limiting some of the things that we talked about because we realized really the organization and its members have really done a lot of exciting things over the years. And if we look from the education side, we really have pioneered many different uh, innovations in the, in the diving industry, some of which uh, don't make people very happy. So for example, the prohibition against smoking I know has ruffled some feathers. And to the smokers, I, I deeply apologize. That certainly isn't our intent. But our intent was to sort of a craft a, an organization that was really dedicated to reasonable fitness and, and promotion of diving uh, excellence. And so we had a number of things like the no smoking, like uh, the first to eliminate deep air, to mandate fundamentals training, which is something that became really obvious in my early cave uh, training days, uh, really to teach with nitrox in all of our classes, helium and recreational diving community, a rigid focus on buoyancy and trim. Uh, some of these, including things like buoyancy and trim, are really not quite common in the industry. Many other agencies are doing that, which was a, a big part of the point in initiating those kinds of activities. Very standardized protocols for equipment and, and, and team groups, uh, mandating uh, requalification of instructors and for students. Uh, we've done a number of those kinds of initiatives. I think that uh, hopefully more people will copy because I think ultimately it really benefits the industry as a whole if we can work towards those uh, kind of innovations. In other areas like exploration, many of you have seen the growing uh, capacity of many of our communities around the world. So we have a wide range of GUE exploration groups. We're now producing an exploration report assembled by Mario Arena, a uh, great project that's available on our website uh, along with the GUE annual report and the project baseline annual report. So people curious, I encourage you to, to look there and you can see many of the far reaching projects that we've had uh, over the years that are ongoing. And now a big focus for us will be to try to make more and more of these projects accessible uh, to our many communities around the world. So in a lot of cases, they've become quite sophisticated projects and so not as open as we want. So we're working really hard right now to make some of those projects more inclusive and also to expand the skill set of our various communities, which is one of the things that I want to talk to you a little bit as well. And then great success in the conservation arenas as well. 
project baseline has really taken off in a number of areas. A lot of really solid and capable players all over the world doing really great assessments and documentation, looking as well to expand GUE outside of those areas. So we're really excited about growing collaborations with groups, groups like uh, ghost net uh, removal. Uh, the ghost fishing group are great. We're looking a lot at reef check. Uh, and other groups around the world, uh, the conservation uh, uh, agenda that we have is really ultimately gonna be far reaching. We have invested considerable effort in Project Baseline on the early front, now reaching uh, over 108 project areas in more than 35 countries. So quite substantial, almost 3,000 images captured and nearly 4,000 visibility measurements in addition to many other aspects within the database. So just a really high level view of some of the things that, we, that we've accomplished uh, over the years looking back. I'm gonna talk about some of the organizational concepts that developed and became GUE in a moment. But before I get into that, I want to also take a second to just discuss a couple of the initiatives we're developing. Some of the details I'm gonna leave for later announcements to save everyone some time. But a few things that we're really focused on is affirming the primary core mission or pillars of the GUE organization, the education, exploration, and conservation components. And these are things that we deeply believe in. GUE was formed to enable these activities, and I think some people lose sight, and maybe even internally, we occasionally focus a little too much around training or practice or precision, and forget the whole point of all of this effort is really designed for the diving. It's all about that, it's all about the diving, which results in our ability to explore to whatever capacity of interest we have, and hopefully bring back ways in which we can serve those environments. So one of those initiatives that I would like to discuss briefly is the scholarship program that GUE is initiating. I've joked with many of our friends and instructors that actually in some cases there are a lot of people that struggle to get into GUE programs. I would have been one of those myself and we would like to really try to find a way to enable people who are struggling a bit to come up with the resources needed and so I've asked the instructors and, and got a resounding amount of uh, hearty support for the idea that we will uh, issue applications and allow people to apply for scholarship uh, to engage in a range of different GUE training programs. So conceivably from the beginning all the way through even to instructor training, this is an initiative that the instructors have warmly embraced and are excited to support, which to be honest really touched me, the degree of support that we saw for that. Uh, you know, People are earning their living and, and, and making a sacrifice or a contribution to the community is really what the organization needs to be all about. So I was very touched by that and we're excited uh, to be developing those plans. Within the next few weeks, we'll start to organize the application and post it on the website uh, so that people can uh, read about that and, and hopefully apply. Another initiative that we're organizing relates to support for our exploration projects around the world. And so the idea here is that we're going to create uh, an exploration group or club and members in that club will help to fund equipment that GUE will purchase and hold and maintain and then individuals who are part of that group will be able to apply. So for example, let's say we buy a side scan sonar, uh, members of that group who have made a donation to support the club will get to vote on where that gets deployed. So members can apply and then vote upon where that equipment gets deployed and gets utilized so that we can build up a more and more sophisticated equipment locker that can support the growing level of sophistication that we see in projects around the world. Uh, so those are both things that are really near and dear to my heart that, that we will be launching uh, this year as part of our 20th anniversary celebration. We also have a couple fundraising efforts coming up, and I'm not gonna to give too many details of that, but I think we have some, some pretty cool things that uh, we're developing and that you'll see in the near term. Uh, one oriented towards the conservation uh, aspect or pillar of our organization, and the other towards the education component. So looking to raise resources so that we can expand a lot of the educational assets that, that we bring to bear. These things, and in general my talk today, should hopefully reaffirm for you that GUE is, is dearly committed uh, to the pillars that resulted in our formation. They were the reason that we all got behind the GUE concept, and they're the reason that we want to move forward into our next 20 years. And a big part of what we look forward in the future is to continue building the capacity and the communities that we ultimately begin GUE in order to form. 
So I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk a little bit about GUE's formational period. Uh, and then after I get done with that, I'm going to come over and talk uh, about some of our new programs that are developed to support uh, our various uh, mission pillars. So several of you have seen in the past, I've talked about uh, Jacques Cousteau. Uh, for many of us, he was a sort of leading example and a big inspiration to me personally. And seeing some of the activities going on uh, with the Cousteau Society were really uh, just exhilarating for me uh, as a young man uh, looking forward to diving. And that kind of sort of organized structural approach was something that I craved and was dynamically interested in and then started to see the beginning signs of when I went to college up in North Florida where I was also influenced by the early WKPP, the likes of a Bill Gavin, with, uh, Bill Main, Lamar English, Parker Turner, uh, people like that and particularly Bill Main who I spent quite a lot of time with and did a lot of diving with. Uh, those people started to show the signs of growth growing community. It was a really small group of us at the time. Uh, the early KPP was really only a half a dozen people helping out and, and diving together and that progress grew over time and I really enjoyed the, the effort towards a standardized approach, something I began writing about uh, really in the mid-1990s. Uh, I spent a lot of time with Bill Main and then later we continued to refine those systems into what became GUE. Around that same time, along a parallel vein, uh, one of my fellow college classmates, Todd Kincaid, and I started diving together and also started to push different types of cave activity. So in the KPP, it was more the deep caves to the north, and then with Todd, more local caves in the area. Uh, but we began hatching the idea for what we imagined could be a really cool global footprint of kind of version of the WKPP, so to speak, but on a global level, pursuing a wide diversity of exploration and conservation initiatives. And the first of those efforts that we engaged was Turkey as a lot of you know, in 1995, and that was a really pivotal point where we started to see what we could accomplish with teams of divers organized around a, a common intent. That was part of Todd's PhD uh, dissertation at the time, and started to really help codify the kinds of things that we imagined for the organization. Coming back from that, the 96 Turkey project, uh, I decided that we really needed uh, to organize uh, GUE as a proper entity. We selected the name. The first website uh, was launched in uh, 1998, in the end of 1998. Some of you will no doubt correctly harass us that it probably looks better than today's website. Uh, but I promise a new website before the end of the year. We have to have it for Mario's birthday. Happy approaching birthday, Mario. Uh, and so, during that time period and the uh, end of 1998, we're starting to teach more divers. We released the first of our websites and there's a lot of dynamic excitement. Shortly thereafter in 1999, we released the first issue of Quest where we start to develop uh, uh, a better conceptualization of the standard practices that would ultimately form in to GUE. We begin talking about formalizing not just equipment specifically, but more the procedural and team-oriented uh, approach more broadly. And from the educational perspective, around this time, we started to really ramp up our intent. So we really designed educational programs, thinking with the end in mind. And so we really focused on building something that was easily portable from one program to the next and maintain a continuity both in the equipment and the procedural components associated with it. And so building a wide range of those platforms which have evolved over time, but for the most part, anybody taking a class now will see quite a high degree of similarity. I feel very confident actually our classes are more rigorously structured and at least as demanding, if not better, with outcome uh, than they were even in the early days. So I'm very proud of the effort of our existing community and all the work that they're doing. The instructors are working hard to really create very solid programs. We've added programs over the years uh, more than I expected as I started to see the need to develop specific types of capacity in various arenas. Many of you have seen us also move into the rebreather world. Uh, obviously we had started with rebreathers really in the later 1990s with the first PVR bass system and then in early 2000 with the RB80. And then subsequent to that we moved in also to support CCR. So we have both pl platforms and Richard Lundgren has done an amazing job bringing that program online. But that's one of the examples of the type of programs that has greatly expanded GUE's capacity to realize its initial vision. 
And I, I can appreciate different opinions because I have some members in our community have been very resistant to CCR over the years. And I was you know, pretty hesitant myself because I spent a number of failed attempts initially entering some of these areas. But ultimately, without change, we perish. And I think that we've really, striken, we've really struck a very careful balance in terms of bringing programs out responsibly, which is another thing that I want to discuss. We've spent a lot of time as well focusing on the exploration component of our efforts, uh, broadening first our knowledge and capacity uh, in deep caves and deep wrecks, and then expanding more towards the community emphasis of these different types of projects. And now there are many dozens of projects a year going on all over the world. And our exploration report is a great way just to see a, a glimpse of some of the most prominent uh, ones in that regard. And as I mentioned at the outset, this is something that I'm very excited to continue to, to refine and expand upon. We've already got projects and plans for next year that will be even more inclusive and looking to tap into more communities and support those accordingly. Conservation, as the third pillar, has been something we developed persistently over the years. It was in the very beginning of our charter, something that we became really adamant about as we explored communities, uh, I'm sorry, explored environments further and further, further into the caves, deeper into wreck environments. We really allowed or saw the sort of migration of our passion for diving transfer into a passion for preserving those environments that we saw under steady decline. And that's maintained itself and in fact been emboldened within our community as something that we're all very passionate about. So you'll see continued expansions and development of project baseline as well as additional refinement and partner conservation group efforts over the years. Many of you have seen also the, the Baseline Explorer effort. Robert Carmichael put tremendous energy, one of our board members uh, put tremendous energy into the development uh, of these kinds of extended capacities. Uh, I think that everyone will agree that the, the expedition ship and subs with divers on board is an incredibly powerful tool. It's still a tiny fraction of what we are as an organization. You know, in the end of the day, we're mostly about our communities, but these kinds of assets are a huge advantage to the organization and allow larger partnerships that would not otherwise be possible. And one of those uh, larger projects that uh, occurred off the coast of North Carolina was in concert with NOAA, uh, one of the larger organizations involved in aquatic conservation work in the world. And I think this is a really nice segue to discuss the growing capacity of the organization and the tools that we try to leverage towards the accomplishment of our, mil of our conservation and exploration pillars. So this image of uh, the, the, blue, the blue view scanning of uh, a submersible at about 800 feet, a submarine at about 800 feet, uh, is something that really relates to some of the other kinds of efforts at extended uh, documentation and extended reach into various environments. Obviously, most of us won't have the benefit of getting in a sub, but we can get further in caves, deeper in wrecks, and we can all document those environments uh, in a more significant and rigorous way. And that is a, a, a good segue into the GUE organization as a whole and its efforts in trying to help realize the next 20 years of our vision by building more tools, by extending our capacity even more greatly, and by helping to refine and assemble our communities into more and more successful entities. And so I want to talk a little bit about these three programs that include side mount, scientific diver, and photogrammetry. And we've had several amazing individuals, really many more than, than we have time to discuss today, who have all contributed greatly. A few of those I'd like to share some interviews uh, with so that we can get a, a, a bit more overview and a, and a bit of a discussion in those different arenas. So I'd like to transition over to a discussion that I had uh, with Chris. I stole him away from some moments uh, on vacation in France, and I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the side mount program. So let's see what Chris has to say about that. How are you doing? Uh, welcome. Thank you very much for taking time away from France to speak to us today. It's nice to see you. Thank you very much, Jared. Thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity of talking about uh, sideman diving a little bit here today. My pleasure. You know, you and I have talked about sideman a lot of times over the years and engaged in quite a few sideman dives, and you've got a long history 
with it. And I think the side mount program is something that I know we're both ex excited about for our own reasons and for the organization. I wanted to ask you, you know, what is the sort of personal level of interest you have? Why, what encouraged you to help support and develop this program? Well, to be to be fair with you, uh, you know, we've been side mounted side mounting since 1996 you know and that was very much based on on, on an exploration interest right uh, as you know especially in mexico a lot of the caves are quite intricate um, and you know whenever you know back back mount configuration wasn't actually practical uh, i would say that you know historically we just dive side mount you know this is how we were exploring for the most part and uh, throughout the years, you know, we we've developed our own side mount uh, equipment. Uh, it's it's uh, it wasn't really pretty to look at initially, but you know uh, what what we did is you know trying to develop uh, a side mount kit that could actually enable us to actually continue on with uh, our exploration. And at the time, you know, the side mount exploration we were doing. Uh, was actually mostly based on, on, on solo diving in the early years, right? Uh, but the initial exploration of Osh Belha uh, from 96, 97, sorry, to about 2001, so the first 250,000 feet of cave explored uh, were actually explored using side mount configuration pretty much, right? Okay, so over the years, uh, you know, uh, whatever was really needed to continue on with the exploration, uh, you know, we've, we've used the tool necessary to do that. It was side mount, we kind of left the side mount a little bit on the side for uh, a few years, just because we thought that, especially for long range penetration, I think back mounted configuration was actually maybe a little bit more appropriate for what we were doing. Um, and then we started diving in the Sian Biosphere Reserve, and you know the caves back there uh, from personal experience. And we thought that at the time, you know, using a back-mounted uh, RB80 configuration was actually most appropriate to continue on with the exploration there. So we've gone back and forth, you know, over uh, 20 years between, you know, different gear configuration, but, uh, you know, using whatever gear configuration, whatever tool is available to us to actually continue on with what we are more uh, most passionate about, which is, you know, cave exploration. And, and, and you know that for spending, you know, uh, quite a few time with us here, uh, you know, in Yucatan, diving the caves and, and enjoying the exploration. So it is true that, you know, in the last <clears throat> few years, uh, we've looked at more intricate caves and 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 the interest has, has shifted a little bit and you know it, it it was good time for us to really you know get back into in, 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 into side mount uh, and 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 to make a more i would say concerted effort on developing you know uh, side mount equipment and actually a, a side mount you know curriculum right uh, for GUE so uh, you know that's that's really our you know interest is uh, for people willing or, or keen on learning uh, side mount to continue on with exploration and now they have the opportunity to do it uh, through GUE right and that's a beautiful segue into my to my next question which is ultimately some folks might uh, you know imagine that uh, you know, we weren't focused on it because it's taken a long time to come out with a class. Uh, why why did, would you say to people, or what assurances would you give them? What, what is the purpose for GUE taking so long to get involved? Um, because I, I, I believe, first of all, that uh, we were a, a little bit of a minority here in Yucatan using actually side mount uh, e equipment, uh, at least uh, on, on the GUE side of things. Uh, uh, and uh, over the years, uh, we've tried different things, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we're not the one to really go out with uh, something that is not completely finished, right? We like to actually think uh, things through and uh, a little bit like, you know, uh, the other classes that we have, especially the uh, 
the rebreather class, you know, it took a little bit of time for that class to actually come through. And it's not unrelated as we're trying to, you know, gauge the different options that we're presented with. Uh, and we still want our student to actually have the best possible education, right? <laughs> side mount, on no side mount. So I just think that sometimes it is worth it for us to actually take the time to actually come up with, uh, you know, a, a good class uh, while everybody else is, you know, <laughs> jumping in. And at the end of the day, what, what you're seeing is sometimes side mount classes that don't really have very much relevance with with cave exploration, right? Okay, so yeah. I think I think it's good for us to have taken the time to develop that program. Uh, we've 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 nonetheless uh, been running uh, beta classes for the last three years. So uh, you know this is actually slow coming, but uh, we're quite we're quite proud with the you know with the end the end result. Okay. So, so building on that idea, you know, I think that one thing that uh, people don't fully realize is the degree to which we still plan to integrate these different configurations. So, I mean, I think in 90% of our communities, conventional back mount configurations are still going to remain the primary choice. Side mount is an amazing tool for a number of specific kinds of environment. Likewise, rebreather is an amazing tool for specific kinds of environments, but we really weren't interested very much in chasing the fad and more in codifying the tool, developing and refining the tool and making sure that all of those systems were as interchangeable as possible. And I know you are really passionate because you and I talked a lot about making sure the side mount configuration was as close as possible. Uh, and you even became a bit of a pain about it sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, to make sure that it was that case. So uh, I think that that's a critical component to the time that it's taken. And I'm really happy we took that time because I'd rather do it well. Uh, then rush something out. So, yes, uh, thanks very much. You're What's welcome. Take care of Thank yourself. You. Enjoy the rest of your week, all right? Bye-bye, Jared. Bye-bye. One, two, three. On move, Okay, thanks very much. That was a great overview from Chris, who was really pivotal. Uh, many of you know Chris has been a leading explorer within the organization for decades. And his great support, along with Fred uh, over at Zero Gravity and Mara and Oz and the guys have all really stepped forward and, and helped to bring that program forward in, in a dynamic way. And then Kirill uh, also has done a tremendous job helping to assemble all of the various arguments and work and refinement. As Chris said, we really try to take these things seriously and really try to test those programs in a significant and elaborate way. So speaking of which, let's see what Kirill has to say about this. All right, hello, my friend, Kirill. It's great to see you uh, on the other side of the world and, and still have allowing technology to give us this chance to catch up. I wanted to take an opportunity to discuss a little bit the new development program in SideMount that you've been helping to spearhead. And uh, I think it'll be nice for people to get a good overview of our intention with that program and get some highlights as to what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, it took some time to uh, to develop it. There is a big group of people working on it, and primarily Chris and Mara, because they uh, probably first recognized how much the overall landscape of exploration has been changing over the last couple of years, I guess, where we have less big caves to explore, and uh, all of a sudden we're, we're facing this choice of either just retracing on or somebody else's path through existing caves or getting to new areas where you might need side mount just to get through a very narrow entrance, maybe need side mount to get through the restrictive passage, maybe just a log logistical issue where you need to do vertical rope work or some dry caving where transporting single tanks is uh, more reasonable than carrying set of doubles or uh, a fully assembled rebreather. So as uh, that landscape was developing around us, we, I guess, recognize the need for it. And, and I think it ties really well into our 20th anniversary as well, you know, uh, helping to support our mission. We have a few new programs of which SideMount is one, and all of them are organized to help advance GUE's mission. 
in this case, uh, both really in the exploration uh, and in the conservation side, since we can now get to some areas and document them better, but also explore them uh, as you've been doing. Talk to us a little bit about the requirements for taking that class. So we are expecting that this class is start kind of made for reasonably experienced cave divers. So cave two certified with at least 50 dives done and uh, registered, uh, who also recognize the needs and limitations of this configuration. And how about teaching? Who's, who's qualified to teach the program? We expect experienced cave two instructors to be able to teach it. Obviously, we expect these cave two instructors to have reasonable site mount experience that uh, headquarters uh, aware of is aware of. Okay, so we'll have some experienced cave two instructors vetted uh, through a review process to ensure that they have sufficient experience. Uh, the hot areas that you people could expect to take this program? Uh, I, I guess Mexico and Florida are the easiest to come to mind, but also as far as I understand, Norway and some parts of Sweden have uh, nice side mount areas that till now are out of bounds for majority of G divers, but I guess these will be nice areas to look at. Well, let's talk briefly about the structure of the class for people who might be curious. How many days? What are the main things people are learning? Any special skills they're going to be developing? It is a five-day program that will include at least 10 dives, and uh, at least four of them should be done in side mount-ish areas with at least three proper side mount uh, restrictions uh, to be navigated through those uh, or throughout those dives. The main skills can be broken in several segments. So one of the most important things as you're learning your side mount uh, is just to figure out the configuration because setting up your system and setting up your tanks properly is, I guess, almost half of the success of all the <laughs> side mount diving because if tanks are not set up properly, it's a nightmare. They're not really side mount. So that's important to, be, to know how to use different size tanks different weight characteristic tanks and how to set them up properly for what you're trying to achieve. Setting up stage is even more complicated and that also part of, of the program, the addition of tanks and uh, their positioning. So there is a lot of equipment discussions and practice. Then uh, there is also obviously a lot of um, time spent on gas planning because it's not as streamlined and linear and it's very multi-dimensional as how you can distribute gas in different tanks and especially again as you start adding stages uh, there are multiple options of how to plan the dive so it's safe and efficient it also obviously puts a lot of emphasis on how to properly navigate small areas how to navigate low visibility areas how to deal with line that's not amazing gold line that you can find in the front of the cave and also what's GE will not be GE without this component. Uh, a lot of times when you talk to side mount divers, they would say, oh, but all of this is very solo oriented type of diving because it's inconvenient to have a second person or a third person in a small passage. So obviously GE looks at main aspects of diving again, how to make approach more standardized, how to make equipment streamlined and standardized and modular and how to apply these to team diving, how to take a efficiently functioning team into smaller passage and maintain teams, the team setup, the team mindset, team procedures, and obviously increase safety by at least two, by bringing two brains. When can they start taking the class? Um, I expect it to be out within less than a couple of weeks. So, and I know right. that Chris in Mexico taught more than four uh, better classes. So I know that people already have really good experience with this program and enjoyed it and uh, diving it. Yeah, excellent. Uh, as with all our classes, we normally beta, you know, multiple runs, sometimes anywhere from you know, sort of five or six classes uh, all the way up to 10 or 15 classes, just to be sure we get it really ready for prime time. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure that there are classes existing on the calendar. I'm sure you'd be willing to do some teaching. Chris and uh, the guys in Mexico are excited to do some of it. I think uh, everybody's ready to kind of introduce a, a new world to some of our existing community or, or even people out, outside the community. 
So thanks, uh, thanks again for your time, and uh, thanks very much for uh, helping organize this program. Let's go side mountain diving one day soon again. Sure, <laughs> sure. All right, thanks very much. Okay, welcome back. Thanks very much to both Chris and Kirill. And I just want to pause uh, for a moment and discuss this sort of idea of off-book versus program curriculums as we are now introducing. So in the beginning, you know, we're always going to have explorers utilizing specific tools to accomplish their exploration goals. That's been going on for more than 20 years and, and will really continue through the organization. As that starts to be more and more organized and the needs start to rise, so originally rebreather and then growing more in rebreather and then ultimately CCR, including side mount, now you see in our additional programs, as those things, as the need becomes stronger and as more of our members in the community benefit from it, then we take the onus on ourselves to build thorough and integrated programs. And it's at this point that we believe those that skill set, those tools, that capacity now is really necessary to support our various communities and ultimately our organizational purpose. And that's that's what you're seeing and I think echoed in the comments some of the guys are making. Okay, before we move on to another interview, I'd like to thank everybody for your great feedback. Uh, thanks for all the enthusiasm over the, the scholarship program uh, in general. We currently anticipate uh, scholarship potential for all levels of GUE training. Uh, so that is uh, one of the things that we've been negotiating with some of the instructors, but so far the feedback has been very positive. So I envision seeing the possibility of scholarship at all various levels. Uh, the details of which we plan to release in the next month. So we give ourselves a few weeks to take in the last of the feedback and this, this announcement on Facebook Live is a way for us to also solicit any more, uh, any more questions, comments, uh, while we review the process and formalize the application. Uh, but we will uh, see that in the near term, so look for those details on our website and on, on Facebook as well. We had questions about CCR 1 and 2. Uh, CCR 1 program is uh, finished. It's uh, essentially they're just building some student workbooks and waiting for the um, final finalization of the newest version of standards, but I would expect that available within the next month. Um, I think that was the primary questions we had, so thanks for that very much. The next program I'd like to talk about was the Scientific Diver Program, which is an extension of our Documentation Diver Program, uh, which is a great overview of a variety of different techniques, whereas the Science Diver Program is going into more details uh, with the scientific method and more rigorous process associated with data gathering and really helping to take project baseline and similar initiatives to the next level. And Diogo has been really certainly working with a number of people, but heavily spearheaded and, and took this uh, under his own wing and really helped develop it. I think he had a great support from Sam Meacham as well. But I'd like to talk a little bit to Diogo and uh, let you hear what he has to say about the Scientific Diver Program. So let's check it out. All right, hello, Diogo. It's a real pleasure to be speaking to you. I appreciate you making the time to talk to us about something that I know that you're very passionate about, and I am also very excited, our new Scientific Diver program. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how you see the, the, the reasons for GUE creating this program, for you being willing to put so much energy into it and spearhead it. How do you see that it fits into our curriculum? We all know uh, that our main pillars are education, conservation, and exploration. And GUE has been uh, very motivated into the exploration uh, part of it and also to the conservation with especially project baseline initiatives and other initiatives such as ghost fishing. And uh, somehow we started to see that there was uh, some disconnect between our training and our conservation initiatives. Uh, we end up at this connection uh, long ago since the, the beginning of the agency. Uh, with the exploration, so our education is very focused on exploration, but for the conservation somehow uh, we started to develop tools uh, already a little bit later on our history, such as the documentation diver class, which is an excellent class to, to take uh, as well in this, uh, uh, in this view for conservation. And uh, basically what we started to, to feel is that our community was uh, lacking the proper knowledge 
and capacity to develop uh, conservation uh, projects together with uh, proper research institutes. So this was uh, our main uh, goal, our main motivation was to be able that these research institutes would rely on GOE as uh, a, um, a source of divers to help to develop science-based projects. Who might be interested in taking this class? Because it sounds pretty pretty scientifically oriented. So do you think it's open to a wider range of our audience? As the years passed, we start to fine-tune the class and we open it a little bit more broadly. So actually, uh, everyone that would be interested in uh, project-oriented diving and everyone that would like to have a participation. Along those lines, can you tell us who, who, might, who can take and teach this kind of program? Uh, all GOE divers with a Rec 1 or a Fundamentals class can take the class uh, as students. And to teach it, uh, one must be a GOE instructor with relevant scientific diving curriculum and a bachelor in marine sciences or nautic archaeology. Okay, perfect. Well, that's exciting. Now you've sold me on it. I'm ready to take it. Uh, when and where? How do I get into the class? Uh, well, to take the class for now, you can contact me directly to my email, uh, diogo at goe.com. Uh, and we will have classes uh, very soon announced for September in Bali and also in September, in um, September, October uh, in Spain. And we're also planning a class towards the end of the year in December in Italy. All right, well, excellent. Sounds like a lot of upcoming opportunities and, uh, and no doubt several of our scientifically qualified GOE instructors uh, have expressed some interest. So I think over the next year, we'll be able to provide a, an easier route for a number of people around the world. That's exciting, Diogo, much appreciated. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we let you go? Uh, no. Uh... I think we, we've passed all the points, and thank you very much for uh, this opportunity. Well, that, that's really exciting, Diogo, and I can't thank you enough for all the time and dedication you put in over the last almost two years now, I guess, of a pretty focused effort to get this thing delivered. Even longer if we count all the time, uh, but, it's, uh, but it's very much appreciated. Uh, your dedication is a really great representation for the organization, and it's very exciting for me as, as we're going into our next 20 years to be able to have these kinds of tools uh, in our arsenal to take on ever bigger projects with greater level, levels of sophistication and capacity. And uh, looking forward to seeing you again soon, maybe uh, near you for a scientific project. Thank you very much. All right, you take care of yourself. Have a great day. Thank you, bye-bye, see you later. And welcome back again. Uh, I hope that you're getting a little bit out of some of these different class overviews. I'm really uh, thinking the scientific diver is going to become a significant arsenal in our tool shed, our ability to gather uh, greater levels of detailed data and utilize that in project baseline groups and globally. Uh, so I hope uh, those of you with that kind of inclination will, will look into that sort of program. I think we can really go a long way emboldening our communities with greater and greater capacity as we expand the type of projects that we do. Addressing a few questions, um, asking a question about the, the length of time it uh, has taken or why rather to get into side mount training after 20 years of people doing it. Uh, and I, that was really what I tried to speak to earlier, which is really just the reality that explorers can utilize those tools and refine them and use them on a case-by-case -case basis. But as they become more common and more needed, uh, then we need to port that capacity and those ex the experience of those explorers into a standard platform that makes sense to support our community. So this way we don't have everybody showing up with different configurations. We don't have people who have different levels of knowledge or experience, people trained with different ideas. This is really about creating these types of tools to embolden our community, which is uh, the specific purpose for its release. As uh, you and others have noticed, many people have been side mounting our community for a long time, as they were rebreather diving before that. Uh, but when it reaches a critical mass, then it makes sense. 
naturally rebreathe their side mount might make sense, but this may be the kind of scenario in which it would probably stay more specialized for longer because there are fewer needed applications. So in other words, fewer reasons for a, a significant number of divers to engage in that activity. And once side mount exists as a baseline, then developing it for side mount, uh, developing rebreathers for side mount may or may not be an organizational priority. This is something we don't have as a, you know, this year priority, but certainly something that we are doing, have done, and will do, and thus we'll look at its portability and relevance. Also, I did neglect to mention that TAC1 for CCR1 would be part of that standards uh, uh, permissibility. So when the, those programs are released and available, then TAC1 would be the entry level uh, for CC, CCR1, the entry level when we have two CCR programs. Okay, so our last discussion then, our last course that I want to uh, run through quickly is our photogrammetry program. And similar to the other programs, the, you know, developing photogrammetry models is something that you can certainly do on your own. Uh, and as you'll hear John talk a little bit about, this is something that one could beat their head against the wall for quite some time. And many different individuals, Richard and John and others in our organization, spent considerable time building an expertise uh, in this kind of platform. Uh, many of them spent hundreds of hours getting good at this at Activity, and it's something we're finding to be really vital in more and more of our projects. It's such an incredibly powerful tool that I'm excited and grateful for John's effort to bring it into our program. So let's see what he has to say about our photogrammetry class. So, um, you know, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about what, what you perceive to be the value to GE, you know, why, why did we invest energy in a course specific and kind of your interest in, in photogrammetry as well? Sure. Um, so I think we uh, invested the time into creating the photogrammetry class because it's becoming a more and more a core part of any of the exploration projects and the archaeological projects that we've been doing all around the world. Um, but the 3D modeling element seems to be a really good way of capturing imagination but also giving really good scientific data to the biologists, the archaeologists, the geologists, whoever it is that we're working with in, in partnership on the projects. Okay, well, well excellent. Uh, you know, for me I've been fascinated with uh, uh, with photo mosaics and, photo, and then photogrammetry almost immediately. I mean they've been hugely useful to us. It occurs to me that probably there are a few of our listeners, at least, that are not familiar with the process. So if I summarized it by saying, you know, getting a full scale uh, round of images of a particular object and stitching those together, would you add anything to that description? Do you? Uh, um, no, that, that's, that's, that, that's pretty, pretty, pretty close to what I'd, I'd say. The only thing is I'd also make a note of the fact that it's not four or five photos, it's four or five hundred. <laughs> to share. I think that's, a, that's an important uh, level of distinction so that people get an idea. And obviously four or 500 in, in small to middle sized kinds of objects, but you know, yeah. quite cumbersome. Do you know how many, for example, on the Mars rack, do you know where, uh, what Ingmar's up to in terms of images? Before this year's project, I think we were around 41,000 images and we probably generated another uh, 15,000 this year. So, uh, you know, we've talked a, a little bit around the subject. Let's talk briefly about you know, what, what people, what kind of skills people are learning you know, what, when they come and take that class. Give me just kind of an overview of the days and the skills and the, you know, the deliverables people are getting. Sure. Um, so the, the first thing that we're going to be doing on the class is basically looking at the way to navigate around the object that you're trying to capture. Um, Anything that's more like a, an individual artifact is going to have a different procedure to something that's a more flat area. So we look at the various techniques in terms of just moving around. Um, we look at how to set up the camera and we look at in a pretty basic manner um, how to set up the cameras, how to set up the lighting, how to work as a team to arrange yourself to capture the data. Um, and then what we do is we go in and we give it a go. Um, after we've got some data, we come out, we try to process it generally and pretty much on every beta class that we've run to, to date, that first dive doesn't generate a very good model, even any kind of model, but it shows us exactly where the problems come from and we can then go back in for the next dive and 
uh, improve and then on the third dive improve again so that by the end of the class the team are capable of creating a a model of a small object or small area um yeah, three four five meters kind of square kind of territory okay excellent and over how many days um are, are we running that yeah so the class is running over four days um it's three dives but four days so the first day is all dry we do um, like in almost every other class we do dry runs and we we work through the um the computing side on the first day so that people have an idea of the workflow and then day two three and four is a decent length dive in the morning followed by processing and um all of the computer side in the afternoon for each day okay Excellent. And, and how about minimum requirements for people? Who's, who's able to take the class? We've opened the class to anyone with a fundamentals recreational pass or a um, recreational diver level one pass um, with a bit of experience after the class. And how about teaching wise? Who do we envision being uh, qualified over time or now? We want the instructors to be real experts at photogrammetry and have. So we set the, the bar quite high for the instructors that. Um, they obviously already need to be a GUE instructor, but we also want them to submit a portfolio of models that they themselves have created and processed. Um, and there's, there's a reasonably long list of things that we want to see in that portfolio. And then finally, there'll be a, an, an instructor evaluation where they have to teach a full class under the um, the direction and assessment of a, an examiner. So for anyone out there that has mild, even mild interest, I would really strongly encourage you. I mean, the, the developments in the arena from photogrammetry have truly been breathtaking from my perspective. And utility is so far reaching that I think we're gonna see almost every project. It's hard to envision a project that we would conduct of any merit that wouldn't have at least some bits of photogrammetry. And I think projects over the next several years are gonna be probably largely dominated by photogrammetry activities, uh, just, just given the power and the usefulness. So if you're interested in, in projects, I think one of the best ways to get on a project is to be able to you know, say, I, <laughs> I've got my photogrammetry down, you can send me with a team and I'll be able to capture it. And I know John's put a ton of effort into making sure that a lot of you will be able to miss the frustrations that he's experienced, which is actually kind of him, since most of us just like to uh, you know, hide what we learned and laugh at everybody, right? Uh, so that very generous on his part. Do you have any classes on the schedule now, John, or know any that are currently organized? Yeah, so at the moment, there's a couple of classes currently on schedule in Australia in September. Um, and then I'm starting to talk to people about um, potential classes through the autumn and into the winter. So kudos to you. Thanks very much for all the time you've invested. The beta frustration part of the, the course curriculum and uh, we really look forward to having it out there and supporting the community. So with that, I, I bid you adieu and wish you the absolute best in your project in uh, Sardinia. Please be sure to do a lot of photogrammetry for us. I, I'm, I'm doing my best for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cheers, mate. Great seeing you again. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye. All right, thanks very much to John for that overview of the photogrammetry class, something I'm really happy to have in our arsenal, especially given the frequency with which it's utilized in a variety of projects. It seems that almost every project I'm involved with has at least one significant need, and many of them are overwhelmed by needs for photogrammetry capacity. So those of you who are interested in being involved in projects, this is one of the, the tools in your arsenal that can really make you extremely attractive to a project to get involved with. There's a tremendous wide, tremendously wide range of value that we can uh, apply this skill. So I also want to thank all of you because uh, you know we're approaching an hour and I'm conscious of that and I'm coming to the end, I promise. Uh, we had great enthusiasm, uh, hundreds of people from a variety of places around the world, uh, which is great, a great enthusiasm. Thanks for all the comments that you've been relaying our way and for your passion and enthusiasm over the scholarship program and the courses in general. Uh, speaking of uh, one of those questions, the scientific diver uh, and European norm question was actually a really good one that I neglected to mention. We developed that scientific diver program to meet the European norm standard. And 
this is, limits the number of people that can teach the program because you need a Bachelor of Sciences uh, in an, an approved area and you really effectively need to be a scientific diver. So there are going to be a limited number of people that carry that bachelor's and meet the other qualifications. So I don't anticipate you know, more than a half a dozen instructors uh, over the next couple of years. But those that are uh, able to teach that class will be able to offer significant value to the participants and to the organization as a whole. So we've, we've really covered a fair bit of ground over the last hour. Um, again, really appreciative of everybody's commitment to the time. And I hope uh, any of you who have uh, resisted jobs or quit your jobs in order to join aren't too terribly disappointed. Uh, it's been great having you all here. And I want to close out by uh, relaying my uh, sincere hope that you all have an understanding of, uh, of our passion for the organizi organizing principles of GUE as a, as a corporate entity. We started it as a nonprofit back in 1998, specifically to try to garner more volunteer support and to show our intent to make a positive effect on the industry, to focus our efforts in the education and the conservation arenas. And we're as true to that commitment now as we were then. We have more resources and we're getting hopefully better at what we're doing. And we're now channeling ourselves in more and more dedicated ways. I realize for some of you who might not be part of our community that, that our rigorous focus focused, uh, goal-oriented effort might appear to be a little bit too militaristic or maybe a little bit too serious. Uh, I'm sorry if that's the case because I think if you spent time around people in the organization, most of you would appreciate that we're all just super passionate about what we do. We're actually a lot more relaxed than it appears on camera or otherwise. And I, I think that our communities really offer a tremendous place to really engage a lot of truly passionate and fun-loving people. I've really met my very best friends through diving in general and in particular in the communities of enthusiastic supporters we have around the world. So we're working really hard right now. We've put a lot of energy over the, the last year, especially into to organizing and finalizing our development plans for the next 20 years. You'll see a number of these initiatives start to take shape. I really wanted to put them out there to you as a community because we really appreciate your feedback. And, and as a nonprofit, to be honest, we rely on that. So we really want to know what's interesting to people. And we really look to generate enthusiasm and excitement on your side so that we can get some support to help fully realize a lot of these different initiatives. So 20 years from now, I hope to be visiting you again. Hopefully I'll be a little bit younger and more engaged and ready to continue for the next 20 after that, but I'm gonna take it 20 at a time. So thanks again. I'm gonna leave you all to your day. I really appreciate you joining us and I look forward to the next chance to speak to you and articulate some more of GUE's exciting activities. Take care everybody.